Yes, you can now see my slides. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And you can hear me? Yes. Oh, fine. Well, I will start. So the focus is on platformization of education, which I see as a, uh, as a global shift, um, which digital platforms are technically integrating into the fabric of public schools and classrooms worldwide, but also in Europe and the Netherlands, uh, transforming their social interactions into economic dynamics. So technically speaking, platformization is increasingly dependent on cloudification, uh, to which I refer to as the conversion and migration of data and application programs to corporate servers in order to make use of cloud computing. So in the Dutch cloud classroom, teachers and students work locally with a hardware device, such as for instance, a Google Chromebook, within a large variety of online educational software applications, which they access via the internet as a service. Uh, importantly, none of these web apps exist as standalone products provided by single companies. In the cloud classroom, application program interface, also known as API, cement educational apps into seamless and often invisible stacks of layered software services running on different servers in varying locations and developed, managed, and updated by varying often for-profit businesses. Such complex software arrangements are often described as technology stacks. In the stack of the cloud classroom, the upper SaaS level of application functionality seen by teachers and students relies on lower level infrastructural services for storage, networking, and hosting, and mid-level platform services for authentication, large-scale data analytics, and machine learning. At these two lower levels, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are now the main providers of critical online education infrastructure powering small and medium scale edtech applications with machine learning capacities and data architectures for the processing and analysis of large scale learning data sets. In this changing landscape of the classroom, personalized learning technologies are key drivers of a shift towards routine collection and analysis of children's personal data. These personalized learning apps enable the personalization of learning by using algorithmic analytics that can dynamically tailor learning content according to individual student progress and engagement. Not only in the Netherlands, but in many education systems and schools across Europe and the world, personalized learning apps take up a central position in classrooms. In the Netherlands, learning platforms of legacy edu publishers such as Dingle compete heavily for their share of the market with those of edtech startups like Snappet. To process and analyze data that is exponentially increasing in both variety and volume, personalized learning applications are dependent on the computing power, analytics, and machine learning capacities of global providers, such as, for instance, Amazon Web Services, which powers the back end of both Snappet and Bingle. The use of data and machine learning to drive personalization and education is potentially of enormous benefit. Yet the precise way in which data are managed within the complex stacked and proprietary layers of educational web apps typically remains a black box for schools and educators. This situation uh, raises key issues about schools' institutional autonomy and more specifically, their data autonomy. Take for example, the learning platform Bingle. So Bingle was originally developed by Belgian publisher Van In in 2011 which is a subsidiary of the K-12 European publishing company, Sanema Learning. Bingle was gradually rolled out in other European education systems represented by Sanema's line of subsidiary publishers, amongst with Dutch publisher Malmberg in the Netherlands in 2019. Bingle is now commonplace in European primary education, including the Netherlands. As a local edtech application provided to Dutch schools by Malmberg, Bingle offers teachers and students a recognizable and trusted online interface for personalized education designed as a set of storified and gamified worlds. Yet Bingle is seamlessly cemented into invisible stacks of layered software services developed, managed, and updated by varying tech companies. In 2014, Sanema Learning contracted with New York-based ad tech company and global leader in personalized learning technology, Newton, Newton was founded in 2008 as a platform technology enabling third parties to build personalized learning applications. And with the big hype surrounding personalized learning around 2008, Newton quickly raised hundreds of millions of venture capital, including early investments of the large American educational publishing houses such as Pearson, 
which started building a learning app on the Newton platform. Worldwide, many other publishers uh, in Europe and across the world, and also tech companies followed. In 2014, Sanoma ordered Dutch publisher Malmberg to redevelop the adaptive backend architecture of Bingle to integrate with Newton's platform. When Malmberg launched Bingle to the Dutch market in 2019, Newton powered the, uh, the backend. And so through API integration, Newton provided Bingle with adaptive recommendations and analytics for constructing personalized learning paths for students and for developing dashboard visualizations, helping teachers to pinpoint struggling learners in need of intervention. Yet importantly, Newton's recommendation and analytics engines are built to benefit from the scale of data collected by Newton across its global ecosystem of personalized learning applications that are built on top of the platform. To enable processing and analyzing large volumes of personalized learning data at scale, Newton started operating its data and analytics infrastructure on Amazon Web Services. Unknown to schools and to other users of Bingle, the core layer of its platform integrates with Amazon Relational Database Service and Amazon Redshift. Moreover, it uses Amazon EMR, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, to analyze large data sets across the Newton platform. A service Amazon describes as, I quote, the industry leading cloud big data solution for petabyte scale data processing, interactive analytics, and machine learning. As a cloud based application, Bingle is invisibly and seamlessly composed as a hierarchical stack of layered software services from multiple providers. As such, it provides a case in point, evidencing how trusted and easy to use front ends in the cloud classroom are based on proprietary and increasingly complex structures rendered invisible to schools, teachers, and students while being unaccountable to the professional education sector. And this is also one of the reasons why Malmberg and together with Sanoma are currently in the process of phasing out Newton as a backend for Bingle. Nonetheless, as a case in point, the black box of data flows and analytics in Bingle triggers profound questions about the role of private companies controlling students' data flows. So at the center of problems created by platformization in education lies control of data, learning data in particular. Platformization disproportionately benefits the business models of large, medium, and small tech and ed tech companies, which together architect proprietary data governance structures for public education. Schools have limited visibility and control of what is being collected and used, and have little control over tapping into this data for their own benefit. At sectoral, national, and European level, countervailing forces to platformization need to look beyond data protection, regulation, and privacy. Although these companies will all claim that the use of learning data is GDPR compliant and bound to the goal of improving the accuracy of the learning support provided to students, data protection law cannot effectively secure transparency and schools data autonomy without a technological architecture or infrastructure or tech stack built on the very basis of these principles. Based on joint collaborations on different levels, European and national, the educational sector needs to contribute to the development of data governance infrastructures based on transparency and autonomy. This talk is too brief to sketch such an alternative, yet I hope it does spark a discussion about the reform of the data economy surrounding the platformization of schools in Europe. And to further inform this discussion on rethinking data futures in education, I will end this talk with a reference to an excellent recent collection of essays on data in education published by the UK Digital Futures Commission, which if I'm right, uh, has already been discussed by Sonia Livingstone yesterday. Nonetheless, this collection includes key examples for the technical design of decentralized data governance, such as, for, for instance, the development of data trusts. Data trusts would include a key role for private ed tech platforms, yet as well enable schools' data autonomy and control of use by separating public control over data from the provision of data-driven services by private tech companies. Obviously, there are, there are still all sorts of details and complications which need to be sorted out for this to be successfully implemented. Your data trust may at least provide a conceptual basis for a new data governance model that may serve as a starting point for re-architecting platformized digital infrastructures in public education on values of transparency and autonomy. I thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you want to have any additional information, have any 
other questions, please feel free to email me at um, this email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niels, for this very interesting uh, presentation and for introducing the topic of platformization in our panel, which I think is very topical uh, when we talk about personalized learning and assessment as well. And I invite you to stay with us, um, and I invite also the audience to participate in the discussion. So if you have any comments, questions, uh, any observations, or you want to share your country's perspective on the questions that will be answered and the topic that will be tackled upon, uh, feel free uh, to raise your hand and somebody will uh, bring you a microphone so you can, you can speak. So now I turn to our guests who are here with us today and with whom we will exchange on whether there is a right approach to successfully implement assessment for learning policies while at the same time uh, ensuring students' privacy and inclusion. Our speakers will also touch uh, upon how their countries organize and implement data-driven assessment and where, where should educational authorities put the limits. So um, with us today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Morten Sobi, who is a special advisor at the Norwegian Directorate for Education and Training at the Department of Research and International Engagement. Morten has previously worked as leader of several Norwegian projects on digital competence and innovation in education. He has been executive editor of Nordic Journal of Digital Literacy and is member of our board of directors, European School Net Board of Directors, since 2010. Martha uh, Stratemeyer is a senior advisor at Kennisnet, the public organization for education and ICT in the Netherlands. And beforehand, she was a director of OpenWeb, a spin off company of the University of Amsterdam, uh, which originated from her PhD project, Math Garden a new educational and scientific instrument in which a new method was developed um, for combining computer adaptive practicing and testing. Then we have Markus Pua uh, from Estonia, who is the head uh, of the field of learning pathways of the Estonian Ministry of Education and Research. And during his career, um, he has managed the development of Estonia's e-government for eight years. And as a member of the country's Educational Information and Technology Foundation, he has started the Personal Learning Path Infrastructure Initiative in 2018. And last but not least, we have with us Pip Kungas, who is Data Architect at the Ministry of Education and Research of Estonia, and is also the initiator of the Personal Learning Path Infrastructure Initiative together with Margus. He leads uh, standardization of data mod models, vocabularies, and classifiers used in digital education services and digital learning materials. Pip is also the author of the Estonian National Semantic Interoperability Framework, the Digital Content Strategy for Education, and one of the authors of the Estonian National Data Government Framework. So uh, uh, a real practitioner, I would say, and no <laughs> uh, knowledgeable about data. And myself, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kostantinos Andronikidis, and I work for European Schoolnet at the Development and Advocacy Team. So very welcome to all of you, and thank you for accepting to uh, be with us today. So I will ask, uh, I will st kick start the first round of questions with Marte. So uh, as we heard also from Niels, adaptive uh, learning platforms is widely um, used in the Netherlands with specific applications being kind of focusing more on personalized learning paths for individual student online learning. So how, in your opinion, can we create the right conditions to use such adaptive technologies properly in the classroom? And what do you think is the value of these technologies overall? Okay. Well, first, thank you, uh, Konstantinos. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to have this discussion, I think, important discussion together. Um, yeah, as you already said, I think uh, the majority of schools in primary education use these kinds of platforms, <laughs> either besides their standard teaching methods or even as the core of their uh, teaching, mostly in arithmetic and language learning. So I think we have quite some experience in the Netherlands. Um, and what you saw is that at first there was yeah, kind of a hype. Everybody saw the potential of these products. And we are learning now more and more about the right conditions. So maybe start with the value and then yes. go to the right conditions. Um, so I think we heard a lot about yesterday, what, are, what are, should we focus on? What should we keep in mind when using these platforms? But let me start with, uh, I think, the great potential. What we saw in research is that individual differences between children are huge. We see, for example, in arithmetic that 20% of the children in grade two, uh, in grade one are already above the level of grade two, the mean level, and even 7% above the mean level of grade three. 
but we see it also on the other side. So there are also a lot of children lacking behind. So that really faces a challenge for education. And I think adaptive learning platforms have the potential to let every child work on their own level, making them to uh, uh, get better results, but also make it motivating, because it's not motivating to do everything wrong when you're lacking behind or when everything is too easy. Um, and maybe something we didn't talk about, but I think this is also, uh, and then we come to assessment, um, when you have these adaptive learning platforms, and uh, for example, in the Netherlands, we have two standard tests a year, it cannot be a big surprise if you're looking every week at the dashboard of your adaptive learning platform. So it changes the way we view about assessment and about testing, because you have your high frequent assessment actually every day. It's assessment for learning, it helps you adapt your uh, education, but it can also cannot give you surprises on your standard test. And I think uh, a third uh, advantage is it gives us a lot of insight in how children learn. Uh, in the, uh, the company we work, more than 40 scientific research papers were written based on the data collected with the system, giving us new insights in how children learn. So then coming to the right conditions, I think in the Netherlands we, uh, we often use the four imbalance model, and I think these are the key conditions for using these platforms, starting with vision. And I think vision on the school level, what's good education? How should we use these tools? Where can it help us? That's very important, starting with the school leader. But also vision uh, uh, on a national level, also as a government, how do we see these tools being used? What are our public values that are, should be in place when using these tools? So that's very important. Expertise, we learned, heard about it this morning. Of course, data literacy, so being able to use the data from these systems, but also pedagogical expertise on how to use these systems. So what, how does it change my education in the classroom and how should I uh, yeah, adapt to that? Uh, and third, and then I come a bit to Niels, I think, it's the contents and application. What kind of standards, the quality standards, do we have for these applications? And the first is, I think, transparency transparency in the application itself, so what kind of algorithms are being used to adapt this uh, system, but also in transparency in the tech stack, I think, as Niels uh, addressed in his uh, session. Um, and very important, also the quality standards I heard this morning when we're using this for assessment, questions like, are these valid conclusions that are being represented this, in these dashboards? Are they reliable? So we're looking at the same quality standards we're using for standardized tests. I think we should look into whether we can also implement them in more adaptive learning platforms. And of course, no biases uh, in, uh, the, in these kinds of platforms. And then we come to infrastructure. Of course, good infrastructure on the one side that the technology is in place, but also safe infrastructure, something we focus a lot on in the Netherlands as these platforms are being used more and more. It's also, also more interesting for hackers, of course. So a good uh, cybersecurity uh, policy should also be in place. Thank you. Uh, you put a lot of uh, <laughs> topics in place, and I think uh, it's going to be very interesting for our audience as well. So I'm coming now to Morten and also, Norway has a strong emphasis on developing a national strategy um, for knowledge production and utilization of educational data. So I wanted to ask you uh, to share a bit more about these developments and what is the main objective uh, and the overall kind of um, plans that you have there. I will, and uh, let me first just have a remark on uh, uh, two trends uh, we are trying to deal with uh, in the strategy. We have heard from uh, many speakers that we have two, let's say, opposite trends. One trend is uh, data processing for the best of the edtech, mm -hmm. and another trend is uh, data processing for for national policy and for for better learning. And it's two opposite trends. And when we hear about uh, the platformization, that is a kind of meeting point between the trends because if you have uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft School or you have uh, a platform from uh, a big, big publisher, much of the data will be uh, locked inside the platform and it's not that easy for policymakers, researchers, teachers, students to, to use that kind of data uh, processed in the in the platform in a 
creative uh, way. Anyway, um, the Norwegian strategy, um, just a few words about the context. Uh, uh, the infrastructure is, of course, very important if you want to, to, to track uh, uh, data uh, on learning. So we have several indicators of uh, how far we have come with digitalization. And we have in Norway almost a one-one uh, solution uh, regarding students' access to digital devices. So in primary school, digital devices are most widespread at the secondary levels. 98% of secondary school students have their own digital device in grade uh, levels 5 to 7. The proportion is just over 90%. And in grade level one to four, the proportion is 80. And upper secondary, we have 100%. Anyway, the key mission in our uh, national strategy and also the action plan for digital education is to, to formalize a collaboration on the digital ecosystem for, for primary and secondary schools between the, the national authorities, the, the municipal sector, and, and the suppliers based on... Um, a, man, a government's coup management model, where we try to uh, ensure a common understanding and goals for the development of an ecosystem. And we have lots of work going on with a better coordination between different uh, activities. And we put a lot of resources into creating more transparency. And also, uh, clear goals on how to ensure the progress in the development of the digital ecosystem. So the key words in this digital action plan is infrastructure, digital competence, and developing educational data for policy, practice, and research. So we have a new plan uh, running from January 2023, which will build on the same goals. And the long-term goal for the National Digital Action Plan is to, to develop um, uh, research into more learning analytics at the national level that, will, that allows advanced multi-level monitoring. So policymakers at the national and regional level, municipalities, school leaders and teachers will then be able to retrieve more data on their specific level. And implementing this vision in, in practice is complicated because of questions around ownership and access to, to data. So data needs to be scaled up and down uh, with communication between each learning resource. And the resources need to be tagged to the, the goals in the curriculum. So, um, so it's... Uh, I also agree with, uh, with Nils here that we need to look beyond GDPR and, and the privacy if we want to have a kind of progress. And we have to also remember that tracking down students struggling in mathematics and science and using data for, uh, let's say, improvement is, is a positive thing and uh, we shouldn't be so obsessed with uh, GDPR that we forget that we, we, we need to aggregate data for, for better policy and for better practice. Thank you very much. And I see there are quite a lot of similarities in the, in the national strategies um, between the Netherlands and, and Norway. And now I turn to the colleagues from Estonia. And uh, I'm going to ask first Margus um, about the Estonian ministry's new um, Estonian education strategy for 2021-2035 which is the, the guidance kind of path towards achieving uh, the objectives you have set with regards to education in the next 15 years. So I wanted to ask you if you could share a bit more about the main actions um, with regards to formative assessment uh, that is taking place in Estonia currently within this action plan that you've prepared. Thank you, Constantinas. <coughs> and I'd like to say thank you all of us because uh, said today is very uh, interesting and uh, useful, I, I think, for, for all of us. It's, it's true that uh, uh, in Estonian education strategy, we uh, focus uh, uh, to the student-based uh, learning process. 
and uh, the ambitious goal, goal is to develop an open education ecosystems which supporting personalized uh, learning. Yesterday, in some one of the workshops, we discussed about what is uh, 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 formative assessments means. Um, I think we agreed uh, that uh, it is a, an open uh, communication between the teachers and students about learning and learning results. But in conclusion, I met that uh, arise the questions, how we can to get more uh, effect from the uh, formative assessment. I think uh, to answer these questions is the main uh, um, idea or what we, we like to stress out, uh, we, we have the attention to, to the learner itself. And uh, according to the questions, the activities to answer these questions about the formative assessments and to achieve our goals in the strategies, we all the activities divided by two. Uh, of course, uh, since the um, teacher is and reminds the uh, key person in planning, uh, supporting, uh, and providing uh, feedback uh, in the learning process, uh, the first group of uh, activities here re related to development, uh, the teacher's competencies, including digital skills and data literacy, what uh, during these two days, a uh, lot of the presenters and uh, uh, people we, we, we discuss um, uh, about this. But the second group of activities is aimed to improve the learning capabilities. And uh, this is um, our, our team main idea, uh, what happened when we're talking how we can improve the self-learning process. We all the time talking about how we can to teach and how we collect uh, learn, learner data to improve the teach. But we don't talk more about how to improve the self-learning process. And when thinking about the self-directed students, there are at least four questions um, that the student uh, want to answer. So when we're looking at the student in the learning process, I, I think it seems quite um, helpless. All the activities uh, uh, depends what teacher think, what teacher idea have, what teacher plans the learning process, but the learner for this, not very, 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 uh, not special services or what help to set up the, their own goals and to answer the questions where are uh, I, I are on the, my learning, 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 learning process. So first question is uh, what do you need to learn? We have to answer these, these questions. The second one is uh, how and uh, by what to study. Uh, third one is um, uh, what uh, and how I have learned. And uh, uh, last of what do I still have to learn next. So uh, last two exactly related to his um, uh, formative as as assessment. Uh, and uh, uh, for learner centered uh, uh, to answer the first questions, uh, we have uh, uh, started uh, the project uh, where we try to describe uh, all the uh, learning outcomes. Uh, that means uh, we're going, started to digitalize our uh, national curriculum and uh, school curriculum and uh, makes a, a relation for every, every, every every learning outcomes. If we have machine readable uh, curriculum, then we can to share this information and uh, for example, on the uh, service provider can develop the, some, uh, so, some services for student uh, uh, which help to set up their own um, uh, goal on the learning, 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 learning path. The second initiative uh, which helped to answer the question how and uh, by what uh, 
to study is we improve the learning uh, materials uh, 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 and uh, make it uh, 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 more 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 useful and uh, the main idea is that uh, every le learning materials uh, uh, can generate the raw data with uh, with we can use uh, from we talk uh, 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 learning uh, learning analytics and uh, third one is uh, the 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 initiative was led by PEEP, uh, by PEEP uh, where we collect and harvest uh, data which uh, characterize uh, learning process and, uh, and uh, we, we, we can to share these re uh, results of analysis to, to the student. Thank you very much. And then I go to PEEP to, to ask him how do you believe we can make uh, sure that formative assessment models uh, have the best possible impact for student uh, overall performance and well-being then in from your experience in Estonia very good question so as a as a data practitioner I would actually um, outline two aspects so uh, first thing is um, where I personally I'm very involved is actually the data science part so this is where we actually use machine learning in order to build uh, let's say, uh, predictive, descriptive, and also diagnostic models, uh, which will be used later for uh, giving feedback. And, um, and uh, let's say, and another part is actually application part, where we actually use those models in order to create new value. So, and, uh, and the data science part, it's, uh, it's a very stable one in Estonia. So uh, what we have done so far is actually, um, we have validated, um, we have analyzed which kind of data we need. Argus mentioned that we need to digitalize uh, curricula. So when we are talking about digital curricula, we don't uh, typical people think about, well, this is a PDF, which now is actually in web format. <laughs> so that's not what we have in mind, actually. So what we have in mind is actually full-blown detailed knowledge graph describing how specific learning outcomes, tiny bits, which actually you can master maybe in, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe an hour, are associated with each other. And what are dependencies between those? And I mean, having those dependencies is very important actually for building diagnostic models because if you would like to actually give informative feedback for a teacher or student, where are actually the gaps the student should focus to, you should understand what are you teaching, what are you learning, and let's say how it relates to, let's say, what you have done before and what you're planning to do next. So it's really important, and this is what we mean by actually by this digital curriculum. A knowledge graph of uh, learning outcomes in a very small, tiny bits and pieces described for machines such that they could be used to provide useful information back to people. Uh, another thing uh, we are focusing is actually, uh, we are starting, uh, we understood that let's say to provide, uh, to build such kind of models we actually need to collect data from a variety of different sources. So, uh, uh, Niels mentioned that in Netherlands, I mean, there's one platform which is used in order to collect the data. In Estonia, we don't desire to have login into one, uh, one platform. We would like to have actually for teachers and students and parents, you have possibility to choose among many different tools. But what is important is that the data from those tools could be actually collected together and used together. And that's why in a secure manner and in a privacy preserving manner. So, and this is actually another means, so let's say from data science point of view, what, uh, where we are actually focusing to, to create a data platform where you could actually cost effectively harvest data from a wide variety of sources such that you could actually use those together. It's very important for our models as well. So if you intend to build models for formative assessment or other kinds of assessments as well, we n shouldn't constrain ourselves to limited set of systems or, or sources. Because I mean, learning itself, I mean, it's a craft. You combine different tools, different techniques, and, uh, and um, people foster best when actually you don't have such kind of constrained environments where we're sticking to. 
So at least good students and, and, and good teachers are they're able actually to combine different sources and different uh, methods together. So I, I think from data science part, these are the key aspects. And then you have, let's say, and of course, let's say if you're starting to train models, you, you need to make sure that uh, the quality models is good, that your, let's say, uh, your data sets, what you use for uh, training, uh, there, there is no bias inside, that they are representative enough, and of course, if let's say new techniques, new tools are coming to a market, then you actually are able to uh, collect data points there as well. So, so you could provide feedback, not from a perspective of a couple of tools, but let's say from a wide array of learning experiences. So, uh, and, and then of course you're working on the uh, quality of your, your data models. So data science part, so this is something which is very much here in Estonia. So we have piloted uh, predictive models, building those, those parts, and uh, now we are implementing the data space actually uh, for making sure of, uh, that uh, data is securely harvested. It could be actually used in different uh, environments. And what is most important, the person itself about that uh, for which the data is collected has a control over to whom, when, and which kind of information can be shared. Thank you. So this is very important. And the application part, I, I know you, you want to stop here, <laughs> but let's say application part is something where we actually feel kind of, uh, we see a lot of challenges because this is where we actually need help from practitioners, from, uh, from academia to figure out how to actually uh, take the value out of those predictive uh, diagnostic and, and prescriptive models. So if you have high quality models, how do you actually deliver value to a teacher and, and to a learner? So this is kind of a challenge we, we need to tackle. But Marcus has a couple of plans or programs he is working uh, and, and will probably in a, in a year we have something new to share. There Thank you. Yep. We will be happy to, to share more than when <laughs> you have the new plans. So now I turn uh, to Niels. I don't know if you have any comments, any reactions to what you heard from our panelists. <laughs> so, yeah, well, uh, can, you, can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Great. So, no, m many things have been said, and um, um, I, uh, maybe one of the things, uh, also what Marta, Marta uh, as well sort of emphasized, and Martin as well, but also uh, uh, from the situation in Estonia, is that we all sort of agree that um, uh, uh, digital assessments in these, plat in these platforms uh, enables us to get new and, and great insights into, into how children learn, right? And I think we can all agree. Uh, but for me, the sort of the following question is, who benefits from these insights most? And to what extent does the public education sector and do schools benefit from these, from these insights? And, and who controls how these benefits or these insights are being sort of developed and constructed? And so this for me is a, an, an, an important question in my research, as has so indicated in the Netherlands, we see this heavily uh, sort of privatized sort of data governance architecture being sort of installed. So I was also wondering, for instance, in Estonia, uh, we, we have some initiatives in the Netherlands as well, which we try to have a more public sector initiatives over sort of uh, the, the construction of sort of the, the digital sort of platform infrastructure like uh, public uh, ID systems um, and open data standards uh, are very important. I was wondering also maybe, um, I, I want to hear a bit from how things are developing in Estonia in regards to sort of a more public data governance infrastructure. Yeah, would you like to very briefly answer this? <laughs> So, Marcus, you, you want to answer it, or shall I continue? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I mean, first of all, a couple of things to, to clarify. So, uh, the data space, what we are building is uh, uh, we put the learner to the center. So, I mean, the data collection is not for government. Government can benefit there. It's not only for a teacher. It's not for ETE. It's for the learner itself. Learner is actually the agent who actually is going to create the data about, let's say, learning experience, and would be the main beneficiary as well. Because eventually, what we would like to get is that we would like to have our uh, people who are actually coming out of education system that they could actually cope in their life. So if there's some change, well, they can actually manage that change. They wouldn't be afraid of the data or some third thing if it comes from. Yesterday we heard, let's say, uh, lot of, let's say, things about the threats. So we want our kids to be actually able to cope 
with changes in, in that very complex and horrible world we are living in. So, so we put the learner to the center. But that also means that we need to kind of learn to accept that sometimes the learner is making the choices we just cannot override. So for instance, if a learner itself doesn't want to share the data, some of the data with the teacher, then we should accept it in a way. If a teacher, but I mean, turn, there is, let's say, another thing that uh, it's deeply related to uh, communication and interaction between uh, the school and, and the family, for instance. If school and family do not want to collaborate, if they don't want to share the data, then, uh, I mean, you, you need to rethink how that system will actually still deliver the value to your people. Is this all a national infrastructure? Or are you harvesting data from commercial companies and how do you arrange that they share that data? So we are aiming actually to collect data from uh, commercial uh, uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. We have few national ones as well, but what we have seen is that uh, the commercial ones, let's say, um, they're more widely used. Mm -hmm. So, and there is mu much more variety. So, uh, and what we have done is to simplify harvesting data from there we have created um, additional services which would simplify it. So I think our friends in, in Finland, they have actually chosen the path where they're making point-to-point -point integrations between, let's say, uh, uh, learning systems, systems used for learning and uh, the central, let's say, data space. So uh, we are not so rich, so we chose another path. We have standardized a, a piece of uh, data which could be very cost-effective actually uh, harvested from uh, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think um, you gave a good answer. I think it still kind of raises the question of where the data from the commercial actors go and how they're used. But uh, we will go to the second round and we will have to be a bit more brief. We'd not that we don't have that much time left. But I want to ask uh, Morten about, um, well, the new national platform that you have created called FIDE and, and how does this platform uh, that aims to be kind of a one-stop shop for, for these kind of things, um, really supports data-driven assessment and how does it ensure the protection of the, of the privacy and the well-being of the, of the students? Well, <coughs> FIDE is a centralized identity management uh, solution for the education sector of Norway. Mm -hmm. And in short, it's, uh, it means a uh, common electronic identity management so, uh, so students, uh, researchers, uh, teachers all gain access to a series of digital services uh, with just one username and one password. Uh, so it's a easy and safe data sharing platform. And it also helps um, education and research institutions to keep track of the use of the services. So, and, and data sources and services are linked in a way that makes it easier for service providers uh, and publishers and the companies to, to offer a good uh, uh, a service. And, um, and it's also a platform where we can maintain control over the spread of the personal information. So all the Norwegian municipalities use the platform and almost all digital resources are within the system. So um, we also have um, a lot of, let's say, national um, services. For instance, you, we have a digital planning tool tagged to the curriculum goals. And we use also the, the FIDE system for, for um, national uh, tests. So it's really a very important building stone in the uh, development of a well-functioning digital ecosystem. But of course, it, this is ongoing work. Uh, we need all the time to develop standards and common components to make it easier for all the players to, to collaborate better and interact better. So, but it's also uh, one 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 project which is uh, we just started up is it, it is possible to track data from the teachers and the students' use of digital learning resources. So the plan for the future is instead of doing, for, for example, annual surveys where students and teachers give a kind of self-report on uh, the level of digital competence, 
we perhaps we can do more automatic annual reporting so we can access the uh, what the students are doing when they're logged on what kind of uh, resources they are doing so we can in a way identify different patterns so and um, to give you one example of one of the services we provide it, it's uh, we have been doing digital national tests and then you log into the FIDE system so the goal for the national test is uh, is to have more knowledge about the pupils uh, let's say basic skills in in reading mathematics and in English so the information from the test will form the basis for an ongoing assessment and quality development at all levels in the school system. So we do the tests in fifth, eighth, and ninth grade. And the test will give results about pupils at the individual, group, and school level. So the results will also provide information to local authorities, but also national uh, authorities. So then how should the test be used? The teachers must use the results to follow up the, the pupils and the work on on the job assessment and, and really uh, use the data for improvements. And the municipalities and the schools must use the results as a basis for quality development in education. And researchers can apply to be provided with the results from the national test and they can also ask for access to use the data in the research. So, um, and it's also possible to to track down, in a way, progression because uh, the tests are, are not exactly uh, the same. We have a kind of anchor design so we can, in a way, track down uh, uh, how the students have a kind of pro progress, for instance, in mathematics. So that's just one example of uh, what we can do with, uh, with the national uh, platform like FIDA. Many thanks. And yeah, if you if you want to learn about the the new platform of Norway, both Morten and we have also I think Barbara Watson here that is also very knowledgeable about this. So feel free to reach out uh, in the in the break to discuss more about this. Can I come to Marte and as an advisory body, Kennisnet, um, I would like to ask you what are the main ethical and pedagogical issues. Um, that Kennisnet has identified with regards to the use of adaptive learning platforms? Okay, yeah. Well, I think we've looked into that a lot, and also our Education Council in the Netherlands just wrote a, a big report about it. I think we see the potential it has for education that it takes over, for example, practicing and it frees up time, frees up time for teachers for other activities. But I think the risk, main risk is instead of making education richer, it narrows our vision and goals for education, so that the, the tool is more in the center instead of the teacher and his vision, pedagogical vision on learning. Um, so that instead of only focusing on how should you use your tool, how should you use the tool, but also what's the place in my day-to-day uh, uh, -day education. Um, just an, a short example, for example, uh, we heard about a teacher who said, uh, okay, I uh, they did an activity besides the platform and already knew, okay, I, I see that my pupils are uh, achieving this, I, uh, a sort of formative assessment, that, but then they still had to do the same thing in the system because then they could also see it in the dashboard. And then, yeah, the dashboard gets a different role than where the teacher is in charge. Uh, but I see the potential if they're using it uh, in the right way. Um, but they should continuously re reflect on how they're using these tools and how they can use them to help their learning using the results to change, for example, their education and not follow the system itself. Also, maybe a short example from my time as a developer. Um, we just provided dashboards in which they could see how children were performing, but then we got from the teachers, can you just say what I have to do? So, of course, in potential, we could group the children and say, put these three children together and focus on this topic. We can do that. But do you want that uh, from a tour or do you want the teacher to make that decision uh, by himself? So I think this is also a dialogue between developers and teachers. What do they need from the system? How can it help them? 
uh, but also how, f how far do you want to go? And of course, when you're making those kinds of decisions, then also quality comes in place. How good are those recommendations, of course? Um, uh, a point I already made earlier. So I think it's, uh, 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 and from the ethical issues, I think autonomy is therefore uh, like a, a, a big thing. Uh, the teacher should be in charge and he should decide what to do with the output and the way he uses the tool instead of sometimes you see it, it seems to make life easier, just put them in the tool. And, uh, uh, and of course, also uh, uh, collaborative learning, other aspects of teaching are very important as well. So I think these adaptive learning platforms are very well for uh, skills that need a lot of practicing, a lot of optimization. I think there it has really proven how it can help, but there are other aspects of learning where you don't want to use these kinds of tools. So it's when do you want to use the tool and when not? Um, and, and use it where it's beneficial and don't use it where, uh, yeah, where it's not beneficial. And then I think the final point is again transparency. So transparency on what kind of algorithms are being used. And that also has to do with autonomy. If teachers have insight in how to these tools are working, they can also decide, okay, I, I, for this I believe these dashboards, but for this I have my own insights, I have my own assessments in other ways, so I follow my own path. Yeah, very interesting. And as you mentioned, teachers should be able to decide on their own when and how to use the tools. Yeah, and they need help for that from, yeah. from their school leader, but also I think uh, uh, from our government also helping, also set guidelines for these kinds of tools. Yeah, very well. Thank you. And Margus, I would just like to ask you, um, as Ministry of Education, what is the main way that you make sure that the, the data that you collect for formative assessment are used uh, in, in a way that is protecting students' privacy uh, and information? So what is the main way that you do that at the ministry level? Okay, thank you. Uh, to answer this question, uh, we, we a little bit ex explain how in Estonia organized uh, data exchange. For example, on the register level, uh, all the collections of data is uh, according by, by the law. And uh, about 20 years, we using so-called secure data exchange layer, which uh, it's uh, very easy to manage to know who and why to use the data which collected on the state level register. There is no problem. Uh, the second layer is uh, how to collect and use uh, data on the schools. And there we have the practices that, uh, again, according to the law, every school able to uh, make the contract with the service providers uh, how and which data they collected in their information systems. And on the other hand, uh, and the schools have contract with the parents and inform the parents and which data collected and how to use. And again, in this level, uh, all things I think it's uh, regulated that uh, we don't see their big problem. But w interesting point is what we're starting to uh, uh, talking nowadays when we like to manage the data which directly characterizes the learning process itself. And there, we believe that when we uh, follow so-called my data concept and in reality the learner have control over the data and he or she can share this data when and where they want it. I, I think if we follow such kinds of processes, then a lot of the trust what we're talking uh, tomorrow and today um, um, not issue anymore. But of course, there are rising some new risks, but uh, we strongly believe that uh, ecosystems means that uh, uh, the owner data is actually control who and why they use the data. Yeah, and maybe, thank you very much, and maybe peop could you elaborate a bit how more kind of practically <laughs> you manage to do that, uh, ensuring your students' privacy as a mm. data architect there? Yep. So, yeah, just to, let's say, complement uh, maybe Margos. Yep. So the data we are talking currently about is about the learning experience. So these are like individual activities, like somebody filled the gaps in, in, in a test, for instance, or somebody submit, uh, submitted homework, and uh, somebody made some action in, in some sort of learning environment, which had a very specific meaning from, let's say, educational perspective. It was related to learning outcomes. 
So this is the data what we are talking about, not data about, let's say, uh, uh, <coughs> qualifications or let's say uh, annual uh, annual tests or something like that or examinations. So with respect to learning experience data, so um, we see that there are different uh, use cases. So at the national level, the government needs to make decisions regarding, let's say, how do you, uh, uh, let's say, how to tune or change the education system. So there is need actually for, let's say, a uh, lot of data which describe what is going on uh, in in learning and teaching area. But I mean, by no way there is no need to know who is doing which activity. So from an uh, minister's perspective, it doesn't really matter what John did in fifth grade at, uh, on, on Wednesday in math class. I mean, there is no need for that information. But for John itself, it's really important to understand what he did that particular moment, just to remember where he was and, and how to continue the learning progress. So, and we have decided that in order to, let's say, uh, uh, to, to enable both kind of use cases, we build a platform where internally we keep that data in a pseudonym, uh, pseudonymized manner. So it means that we can analyze the data and, and we can actually derive conclusions regarding education system as a whole or if a school wants to have, let's say, some, uh, some subset of data, do you actually uh, do you, uh, make conclusions regarding the school itself, then it's doable. But let's say uh, by no means that data would be actually traced into particular person, particular activities. But let's say from person perspective, the person can always tell that, I, hey guys, hey system, this is me. <laughs> Give me my data, I want to use it in some application. I was doing a math task yesterday in one environment. I would like to continue my study tomorrow in, in second one. Give me, give me my data and uh, pass it over there. And this is doable as well. So, so and, and this is what we actually uh, we have to, uh, to implement that system. We initiated the project this July, and uh, we are currently in a phase where actually uh, we are already testing the first implementation steps. So if there are some people who are interested in joining us, then just let us know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and results of a project will be open source, so uh, we are really looking uh, for potential collaborators. Many thanks. Continue. Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. And yeah, feel free to reach out and to Pip and Margus about this. Mm -hmm. um, we are reaching towards the end of this uh, uh, roundtable. I just want to ask Niels if you want, if you have any reactions or kind of takeaways we've heard from the national authorities. But you as a researcher, perhaps you have some comments or critical thoughts to share with us. Um, well, maybe uh, uh, as, as uh, um, um, Morton was telling about sort of the, FIDA, uh, the FIDA system, which will be, I, f I find, a very interesting kind of initiative. And um, what I see in Europe is that there's much more space for collaboration between sort of national education sectors on these kinds of technical issues as well. Because in the Netherlands, as mentioned, we have a couple of these initiatives taking place within the public sector for developing, um, uh, uh, for instance, public ID systems, open data standards. Um, but it really uh, often is really sort of, sort of uh, inwards looking into the Netherlands and there's much space for collaboration on these, these, these sort of critical issues. But the same goes, for instance, uh, for uh, data protection impact assessments on uh, different kinds of technologies like Google Workspace. We had an impact assessment in the Netherlands, but Denmark did its own impact assessment, Germany did its own impact assessment, and then they go into sort of debate with Google about these issues, right? So there's a, a lot of sort of room and space for uh, further collaboration and working towards sort of a public education, digital infrastructure in, in Europe, uh, which is beneficial for all European education uh, systems. Yeah, and exchange information, best practices, I think it's uh, a very good point that you make here. Uh, thank you very much, Niels and Pip, Margus, Marte, Morten. Thank you very much for participating in this panel discussion. I would just like to share with you that um, European Schoolnet is also starting this January a new project called Agile Edu, which will be an exploratory investigation of primary and secondary level of what could be the conditions for responsible use of data, uh, for a purposeful use of data for teaching and learning, including aspects of personalized learning and a formative assessment, and to support the system in real time, but also to find uh, the type of ecosystem that would be needed to support all these. The project starts uh, in 2023, 
and I believe it's a three-year project uh, that we are working on. It's a policy experimentation, so we're looking forward to see the results of this initiative. And together with that, we have launched a new webinar series called Data for Learning. So it's a series of webinars provided for uh, our steering committee members and also researchers and, and policymakers at the ministry's level uh, where uh, we, we look at the meaningful and ethical use of digitally processed data for student learning as a way to facilitate uh, kind of an exchange between different st stakeholders in education. And we, every time that a webinar takes place, we publish the summaries online or on website. And at the end of it, of the series, we will publish a, a final report uh, based on these discussions. So the first webinar has already taken place and we had the pleasure to have uh, Nielsen Marte actually as our first speakers. And the second one is taking place in January. We will share more information with you. Um, and I hope you will find this opportunity also interesting uh, for you uh, to consider. Thank you very much all and thank you to our speakers. And I give the floor, I think, to Anne.